Today I'm really pleased to have my friend Alden join my uh, What's a Profession interview. Well, uh, the guest list is complete with Elgin uh, Alderman, who is uh, from the Times and a sports reporter. Sadly, Joe had to go, but you saw from the response he got from the Lord's crowd when he came out to bat, he ran out and everyone was applauding him. There was no ill blood from the fans at Lord's. Everyone recognises that he is potentially, or will be when he retires, maybe England's greatest batsman of all time. Algon works at Times, one of the oldest and the most prestigious British newspaper. He reports over 40 sports. Specifically, he focuses on cricket and rugby. All of my male friends, they are so excited about his profession and I thought it would be very interesting to have Algon join my interview and share insights of his profession with us and see if it's really as glamorous as many people think. Hello Vicky, thank you for having me today. So Algon, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you do? As Vicky just said, I'm a sports reporter at the Times and the Sunday Times. I've worked there for coming to five years now in September of this year. For the first four and a half years I worked as a, a sub-editor, which is a role that many people don't know about in journalism. I refer to it as uh, right, you improve other people's work for a living essentially, you rewrite work, you fact check. I did that role for four and a half years, like I said, until February, just gone, February 2022. And so for the past four months I've been working as a roving reporter. Rugby and cricket are my main two passions, but I've reported on golf, tennis. I don't cover regularly, but I have covered more than 40 sports for the Times because I like the wacky and non-mainstream areas of sport. I did a, a weekly column called Elegant Explains where I would find a strange sport that was happening somewhere in the world that following weekend and I would try and interview some British participants that took part. There were things like fistball and chess boxing, things that are not mainstream sports whatsoever, but that somewhere around the world there is someone intensely passionate about it. And so every week I would write about a different sport and that's how I've racked up that silly high tally of more than 40 sports. I know people are interested in sports, but for you who turn your passion into a profession, that's a different story. How did you take that path? So I didn't really figure out that this is what I wanted to do until I was, I don't know how old was I, I was either 22 or 23. Growing up I'd always been fascinated by all sports. They say that when I was you know, two, three, I was able to drop kick a rugby ball, that I always had the ball in my hands. My parents say that I basically learned to read, reading rugby programs, the, the, the book you would get at a game with a list of all the teams and facts and figures of the people that were playing. And I would always note down what had happened. So whoever scored a try, I'd put a little T next to their name, a conversion, a C. I'd draw a little box if someone got yellow carded and had to go off for 10 minutes because they had uh, given a penalty away. I think I went to my first Wales game when I was five and I remember there would be grown men behind me that would say oh what went on there and I, I would tell them and I was only five and I knew what was going on. Growing up it was mainly rugby and cricket. I played a bit of tennis, a bit of golf. I went to Durham University in the northeast of England where I read uh, classics which is Latin, Greek, ancient history so not nothing very... Nothing related to sports. No nothing to do with sports journalism at all so Journalism had always been something I was vaguely interested in. For the university newspaper, I did a, a blog about how Wales were doing at the Rugby World Cup. They were in New Zealand at the time. And then I left Durham in 2014. A job came up in, in sports journalism, and it was sort of the, the entry level to my dream job. It was to a, a famous cricket publication that uh, I'd read just about every year since I was eight or nine. I applied for that job, despite not really being overly qualified for it. But um, I, I, I came close to getting it, and I thought to myself, right, I realize now that that's what I want to do for a living, so I need to do whatever it is gets me that job next time around. So I applied to do a journalism master's at, at Cardiff University in South Wales. I got a paid internship in the summer of 2017 for six weeks. And while I was there, a full-time position came up as a sub-editor. It all happened very quickly. I went from thinking to myself, I love sport, I love journalism, or I love writing. Why don't I combine the two to starting at the time in the space of 13 months? So it all it all happened very quickly in, in, in a bit of a blur. I suppose it was very competitive to get into sports journalism, especially at tough times. Journalism full stop is difficult these days. You know, it's, it's an industry that's had plenty of trouble over the years as the internet comes in and, and disrupts sort of the financial model about uh, how these publications earn all their money. 
you've always got more people that want to do jobs that, that aren't necessarily there. Having said that, in a way there are many more opportunities because with the internet you've got all matter of websites and publications and now it's very much a global thing because the Times, the London Times, obviously working out of the British cap uh, the English capital, we're no longer just selling paper editions to the people in the area. You know, online, so you can have readers all over the world. So, the, the the strange paradox of modern journalism is that even though the finances behind the whole industry are st still people are sort of struggling to figure them out, you're actually read far more than than they ever were in the past because you're, the whole world is open to you now. So you mentioned for the sports journalist, you need the sports passion and also journalism. I get you are really passionate about sports, but from the journalism side, did you have any prior experience? Funny looking back at it now, because when I was 10, I was the, the captain of the school rugby team that I was in, and the main responsibility of the school captain was that they had to write a match report and read it out in, in assembly on, well it would have been I think Thursday morning. I would write a match report about how we fared, and then I would get up in front of the school and read it out. So in hindsight, that was the first time in my life where I wrote a report on a game and then sort of performed it in front of people. And when I was 16, I was the production editor of the school newspaper. But I was sort of in charge with headlines and making it all fit on the page. So that, that ended up being my job as well, seven years later. All these things that at the time you don't realize will be so useful. You look back and think, Oh, it was all pointing in that direction. I guess the first time I knew about your profession, you, you were interviewed within the podcast. Your voice just sounds so professional. I was really impressed that time. Even though I'm a written journalist by trade, I do occasionally do bits of broadcast. I've featured on Times Radio and uh, BBC Radio 4's The World at One. And uh, I've been on television once on Talk TV to talk about cricket on there. So, Broadcasting, it's not, not my main forte, but it's something I enjoy doing and I'm, I'm, I'm open to doing in the future. I kind of want to touch on the comedy group and I suppose that's part of why you can present yourself so well. Do you think those are connected or not? Definitely. Yeah. When I went to university, one of the first things I wanted to do, in fact there were three things I wanted to do when I went to university. I wanted to play rugby for the university and see what level I could get to. I wanted to do a bit of journalism, didn't know how much but I wanted to do a bit and I wanted to give theatre and the Durham Review a chance. So the Durham Review is Durham's comedy group. Very prestigious now, they've had a lot of good alumni come out of it in recent years that have done great things in, in British television and British comedy. That ended up being the main thing I did at university. I went from zero to comedy guy at the drop of a hat, basically. And I would perform throughout the year in Durham. I'd perform at Oxford and Cambridge with their respective comedy groups. We'd finish with spending an entire month in Edinburgh, capital of Scotland, at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is an international festival where there are plays and films, theatre, you do a show every day, hour long. Some days you'd have three people in the audience, some days you'd have 80, you just never knew. Some days they loved you, some days they hated you and they wanted their money back, and you just never knew. Um, but that was a terrific experience, absolutely adored that. Great thing for learning to put yourself out there right. and deal with nerves, because the nerves never go away. You just learn to deal with them better. That kind of explains the contrast with in your personality. First time meeting Alvin, he's a bit kind of reserved and don't talk as much, but once you're on the television, you can just talk confidently, you know, very openly. I wouldn't associate the organ that I knew the first week I met you to someone that I speak with at this moment. I've always been quite a shy person who isn't necessarily one of, one of nature's great conversationists. I'm not terrible at it, but I'm not one of those people that just adores situations like that at all times. The strange thing about what drives people to be on the stage because often it's people that don't enjoy being sort of the centre of attention unless it's because they're on a stage like that and that's their comfortable place and they struggle with day-to-day -day interaction but when they're on a stage that's their happy place. Very interesting insights. Back to the sports journalist. So you mentioned when you first joined the profession you're more helping the sports writer with their work now you kind of transfer to this role as being a sports writer. Is it a necessary transition 
or is it some choice you made along the way to go through this profession? So the first thing I'll say is the the reason that the role of being a, a sub-editor suited me is because I've always been quite a, a pedantic person. Likes things being accurate, don't, don't like things being wrong. Mm -hmm. So in that way it, it suited me because the job of a sub-editor is, like I say, to correct errors, to make writing as economical and, and fluid as possible. You just make it all better, you just polish it, you just finesse the whole thing. So that was an obvious way for me to get started. It also meant that I had more opportunities to start because a lot of young journalists, they want to be a reporter. That's all they want to be. That's what people think journalism is. And, and that's great because that's, you know, that's such a huge important part of journalism. But there are so many other aspects of journalism that if you are open to several different avenues, then you just open yourself up to far more opportunities to get started. So starting as a sub-editor meant that I didn't have my name in lights from the off because sub-editors will never get their name in the newspaper. They're the, the anonymous heroes of a newspaper. But it meant that I learned so much in those four and a half years because I'd be working with the editors, you're working with the picture editors closely, you're working with reporters closely, you're speaking to them on the phone about something you think they've got wrong. You might just run a query by them and they'll explain it and you'll go, great, we know what we're talking about now. You know, writing was always something that I felt I could do quite well, I thought it came quite naturally to me. Uh, you know, I regard sports writing and all types of writing as an art form, it's like poetry, it's like music. There are rhythms and flows and tempo to the way you write and it's a challenge I've always loved doing. You get better every day, you never, you never perfect the art, but I became an infinitely better writer by working as a show editor because you deal with good writing, you deal with bad writing on a daily basis. If I'd started as a reporter straight away four and a half years ago, then I wouldn't have been anywhere near as good as I was when I started in February this year. What is your day-to-day -day life? Because I know you've been traveling a lot. Elgon also traveled to Tokyo last year for the Paralympic, which is very impressive. No, I've been fortunate enough to, like you say, go to Tokyo for the Paralympics last summer. I was there for, I think, 15 or 16 days, which is a terrific experience. I was the only person there from the Times and the Sunday Times, so I was trying to cover the whole event by myself, basically. But it's a very supportive British press pack, very uh, very friendly bunch. You all help each other out with an event like that because there's only one of you from each paper and you all know that you can't cover everything individually. So it's, it's a very friendly atmosphere where people help each other out. And a strange thing about sports journalism is that your colleagues are in a way more people at other newspapers than your own newspaper because when you go to an event you're there with one person from all the other newspapers so there are cricket writers from other newspapers that I know very well more than I know other times reporters because in inevitably you just spend more time with them. So yes Tokyo was my first big overseas tour that was terrific and then my second overseas tour was to Barbados in the Caribbean I went there at the end of January for 11 days to watch England play cricket against West Indies. And I just got back from the Netherlands. I was in Amsterdam for eight days watching England play cricket against the Netherlands. On a more day-to-day -day basis, it might just be traveling to Northamptonshire to go and do a feature at, the, at uh, the Porsche driving experience for Formula One, which I did a few weeks ago. Or it might be traveling to a sportsman's house or a cafe nearby to go and interview them. Or it might just be speaking to them on Zoom. Or it might be going to a one-off sports fixture, such as a few weeks ago I went down to the tennis at the Surbiton Trophy where Andy Murray was making his uh, starting his grass court season. As of next week, uh, on Monday, I'll be at, at Wimbledon for the tennis, which will be my first Wimbledon, so looking forward to that. I know for your schedule, you don't take normal Monday to Friday kind of working schedule. Sometimes you have to travel over the weekend. Sometimes during the week, you can take a few days off. Generally, what is your schedule like being a sports writer? Being a sports reporter means that you work a lot on weekends because sport happens when the rest of the world stops. So it happens on weekends, it happens on bank holidays, that's when sport happens. So when people say, oh, what are your bank holiday plans? I say, I didn't know it was bank holiday, this sport's happening, I wasn't aware, I'm sorry. <laughs> so it involves a lot of weekend work, you know, sometimes there's evenings involved. When I was a sub-editor, I would all I would just about always start work at 4 p.m. in the afternoon and I would finish at midnight and that was how I worked. So 
I would have social time to myself in the day, and then I would go to work at 4pm. I got very used to, in the, in the early days, sort of pootling around London uh, in the day, getting all my errands done, playing golf on a much quieter golf course <laughs> than anyone else had, or popping to see a, a matinee on the West End, something like that, being off midweek. You're picking these unusual hours to do a job that you think you love, and so it's a balancing act that you're willing to take. I say to people that being a sports journalist is a lifelong gamble that you love sport enough to ruin sport for you. So people often say to me, can you still watch sport in the same way? And I say, yes, I can. It has ruined sport for me. I've never had to report on the Welsh rugby team, fortunately, which would be perhaps the biggest conflict of interest I'd ever have to, uh, <laughs> ever have to entertain. It's not all glamour. People think of it as being oh, you just get paid to go and watch a, a sports game. But then you say, well, I'm at a sports game, but I'm working there. I'm writing a, a report on a match that is happening while it is happening. While you are sitting there with a, a pie in one hand and a beer in the other, I'm sitting there typing on a laptop, trying not to miss anything that happens. I'll have maybe seven, 800 words ready to go as soon as the game has ended. And obviously it would help if there were no errors in there and it was quite a nice piece of work. So the, the deadlines, that can be very challenging. That's something that when people just say, oh, well, that's so easy doing that. I do think, well, until you've tried to write a, a report on a game like that, it's not all, not all sunshine and rainbows. But... So being a sports journalist, what kind of skill sets do you think a candidate needs to have? A natural ability to write is obviously a great thing to have for anyone who wants to write for a living. So what kind of writing do you need? Do you need to write really professionally, like in a business context? Or do you need to write a bit poetic, a bit literature kind of writing? In terms of standard hard news journalism, it's all about writing very, very straight, very straightforward, very just sort of up and down. You just get to the point quickly you put the most important thing at the top, read through a paragraph and instantly know that's unnecessary, that's useless, we don't need that, we don't need that word, that can be said in one word, not four. In terms of then the sort of more, more poetical aspect of it, that's something I really enjoy doing. I really enjoy trying to be a bit more lyrical in the way you write, you know, writing sort of enjoyable turns of phrase or just little little jokes, little bits like that. That's what I really enjoy doing and you know, it's good to be able to do both. Often with journalists, you can read a piece and you almost know who's written it without knowing who the byline is. Really? Because people have different voices. You know, I'd like to think that there are sometimes readers that could read something and sort of know it was me because of the way it was written. I, I don't know that, but I'd like to think that's the case. Aside from writing, what would the other skill sets do you think that can need to have in order to pass the basic entry level? I think the overwhelming thing that they need is, uh, is tenacity and resilience because inevitably people might not want to give you information, people might not respond to emails, people might call you rubbish on the internet. That happens a lot. I've been sort of insulted for my work online um, and it, that's one of the, the, the biggest challenges facing journalists is that you know, thousands of people might have read this and this, this is the only one person that felt the need to insult you underneath the, underneath the comments or whatever. But even just reading that once can be difficult for people so you need a thick skin to deal with the many setbacks and the many times where people are perhaps less than complimentary about you. But uh, again, that's something you develop. It's, it's often difficult to deal with. Where do you see yourself maybe in five or 10 years? Do you have an ultimate goal to be at a position within the industry? At the moment, I'm just sort of a generic sports reporter. Uh, obviously, as you move up the ranks, you might end up specializing in one sport rather than dealing with several. And at that stage, you might end up having a correspondent in your title. So you might be a cricket correspondent or a rugby correspondent. So Alvin, for any younger kids, for the kids in school, I know lots of boys dreaming to be a sports journalist. What would be your advice to them? I think more than anything else, just do journalism in, in some way, shape or form. So I had friends at university who were churning out material for the, for the university newspaper. That was almost the main extracurricular activity they had. And so off the back of that, they were able to get graduate jobs in journalism straight away, despite the fact that they hadn't done any 
official journalism qualifications, they had read uh, a humanities degree like history or English at university, but they had just done so much journalism and just shown so much that it's something that they're interested in that they can do that they were able to get jobs straight away. For me, it was a, a one-year journalism master's at Cardiff. There are other universities like City in London uh, that does uh, a one-year journalism master's as well. There are a variety of things like News Associates or PA where you can do training that might be less than a year, it might be six months, and you can come out with the, the necessary qualifications. There are, so the sort of the main qualification is called the, the NCTJ qualifications, that's sort of the, the industry standard uh, qualification for journalism. You learn things there like uh, media law and, and public affairs and, and shorthand, 100 words per minute shorthand if you ever need to, to make quick notes while someone's talking. If you just say, a sentence. I'll write it down and I'll, I'll show you what it, what it looks like. Um, I am the guest speaker of Water Profession in Vicky's interview. So that's my very sketchy shorthand. <laughs> and so what I've got here is that's I am, because that's an I and then an M, so that's one of the sort of shortcuts you learn. So that's I am, the, so that's a T and an H, then G. That loop is an S and then a line is a T, so guest. Wow. Then that's S P C R, so speaker. I am the guest speaker of what's your, that's a U and an R, your P F shun profession. Uh, I N in, and I just did a big V for Vicky's, Vicky's, and then I, very long T, so that's T R because it's a long T. I T R B W. Uh, and then just a T and a D for today. So it's what I am the guest. T? Sorry? That is T. What, is this D? Yeah, so T is a high line and D is a low line. So if you're just doing today, you just do T and D. So it's I am the guest speaker of what's your profession in Vicky's interview today. End of sentence. That's very cool. I've never seen something like that before. Yeah, no, so if I just, I'll just reel off the, the alphabet as well, so... That's the shorthand alphabet, as you can see, just a sort of more, more economical version of all the letters, so it saves a bit of time and then you weave them all together to make your, your consonant work. <laughs> Alongside that, if you're doing bits of writing, whether it's for your own blog or for a sports website or anything like that, then it's all good experience. Put yourself in the right place, that's when luck happens. A lot of people will say, you know, I was lucky enough to do this, I was lucky enough to do that. Invariably, yes, you've had luck, but you've also put in the hard work to get yourself into the position where that luck materializes. So, you know, like I mentioned in, in how I've got to here, I was doing an internship when a position came up. So in a sense, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time, but I'd already sort of earned the right to that internship. And so I was in the right place and I was able to strike. So you put in that hard work and then you never know how quickly it can, it can turn around for you. So Aldo, you mentioned about rugby in Wales. And I know that rugby is such a big deal in any Welsh life. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so rugby stereotypically is the sport that defines Wales. People often say to me, and it's a bit of a cliche, but that every Welshman likes rugby and can sing. And, well, <laughs> you, you, apparently you for me, I'm a, I'm a walking cliche because I like singing and I like rugby. <laughs> Going back in time, rugby was a, a hugely important sport to Wales, which was, you know, the community, they were very working class communities, you know, a lot of mining communities in the valleys. And rugby was, was how they spent their Saturdays. The, the remarkable thing about rugby, rugby union at the time in the 1970s was that it was a, a fully amateur sport. So you had people playing for Wales against England on a Saturday that come Monday were minors and teachers and writers and you know, all manner of jobs. It wasn't until 1995 that rugby union turned professional and they earned a living from playing rugby. There was, there's another code of rugby called rugby league. It's a, it's a geographical split in the United Kingdom. It, rugby league tends to get played in Yorkshire and Lancashire and uh, in, in the north of England. Um, and union tends to be played in the south and in the counties around Yorkshire and Lancashire. Uh, and that, that came about from a, 
an ideological split in 1895 where working class communities in the north, they would have to miss work to play for their club or their country. So they just wanted some money to fill the gap that, 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 that was missing from when they took time off work. Rugby Football Union in the south around London had a very amateur ethos uh, because there were a lot of well-to-do people involved who didn't need the money because they were, they were quite wealthy. So it turned into an, an ideological split and the, the, the northern teams split away. And ever since there have been two codes of rugby and those two codes of rugby, different types of rugby are played variously all over the world and different countries took to one instead of the other. So Australia is renowned for being good at rugby union, but actually rugby league is more popular there. And New Zealand, very small country, excellent rugby country, plays both. And Papua New Guinea plays rugby league rather than rugby union. But rugby union is probably globally, it's the biggest sport. And rugby is very important to Wales. It, it gives, gives them an identity, you know, They've been, especially with the, the rivalry within the United Kingdom, you've got Wales versus England, the big rivalry, England obviously, country with a bigger population, Wales, the, the, the smaller country next door. You always want to get one over your big neighbours. There was a pop, there was a song that was, as long as we beat the English, we don't care. Uh, that was a, a famous song for a few years. Obviously, that's quite a small time attitude to have and you should be aiming to be the best team in the world, not just England, but that kind of gives a sense of, of what it means to, to Wales to get one over their local rivals in the rugby field. And I'll have Alvin's Twitter account and his website in the description box. Follow him for his future work. I've learned so much today about the Welsh rugby, Jot Hen, and also what it takes to be a professional sports writer. And I hope you also learn a lot from this episode. Until next time!